I'm pretty confident that if we wake up every morning and ask the Lord, Lord, please bring somebody in my path that I can share your great grace with. I'm confident that he does do that. And in a time where things are so dark, um, people are looking for an anchor in this storm called life. They're looking for something that is never changing, something that gives them hope. And I know that if we're people that wake up and say, Lord, bring somebody my way that I can share your love, I think he'll do it. The other day I was sharing with a young man and uh, I had the opportunity to ask him uh, what church he goes to. And he said, and he said I used to go to this so-and-so church. And, uh, and I won't mention the church, but I said, well, what happened? Why didn't you go? And he goes, because I don't really believe the things. I go because it's good morals, there's good parables, there's good stories, but I don't really believe that these stories are true. And I said, well, for example, give me some example. What stories are you talking about? And he said, well, did God really make Adam and Eve? Come on. Adam and Eve naked in the garden with little fig, you know, and, he, and I said, I totally understand. I get it. And then he said, okay, and then Noah and an ark and all the animals on, you know, and then what happened to all the poo in the ark and what happened to this and what happened to that? And, I'm, and I said, I understand. And then he said, what about Jonah? Are you really believe that Jonah got swallowed by a big fish? And I said, well, let me ask you a question. Why are you saying that Jesus was crazy? And he said, no way, man. What are you talking about? I didn't say that. I said, well, hey, listen. Jesus said in Matthew that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female. And for that reason, a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. Jesus said that God made them in the beginning, Adam and Eve. So are you saying that Jesus is crazy? That's not what I said, man. You know, basically, and I said, well, hey, you know, Jesus is saying. And I said, well, Noah and the ark. Yeah, Jesus said in Matthew 24, he said, as it is in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They'll be eating and drinking, marrying and giving and marrying, all the way up to the time that Noah went into the ark. So what you're saying is Jesus is a liar. No way, man. I'm not saying that. I said, yeah, you said you don't believe that God created that, the, the, the universe, that Noah wasn't true. Jesus said that Noah was true, and God created Adam and Eve. And so what you're saying is either Jesus is crazy or he's a liar. Don't put words in my mouth. And I said, I understand. But when it comes to Jonah, listen to this. Jesus said, as Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. You see, this is what I'm trying to say. No matter where we're at, no matter who we're speaking to, no matter what their argument is, it always goes back to Jesus. You see, Jonah in the well, well listen, Jesus said Jonah in the well is true. So everybody has to come to terms with who Jesus is. He's either a liar, he's either a lunatic, or he is who he said he was. The son of uh, God that comes to take away the sin of the earth. And so when I was done with this young man, he, I said, so let me ask you a question. Who do you think Jesus is? Is he a liar, a lunatic, or do you think he came to save you from your sins? And he said, well... I'll get back to you on that one. And we did, see, we got off Noah, we got off Jonah, we got off creation, and Jesus is the focus. Jesus is always the focus. But I understand. I understand. That's why we need to study to show ourselves approved. And I understand Jonah being swallowed by a big fish. Yeah, he really did, and it's here. And Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose 
to flee the Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. If you pause there and give me your attention, I kind of like this story. First of all, if you're taking note, Jonah means dove in the Hebrew. And Amittai's father means truth. So Jonah is a son of truth. His name is Dov, and I thought, you know what, that's interesting. Nothing is by accident. God doesn't do anything by accident. Jonah means Dov, and he's the son of truth. And I thought, that is us. We are, Dov means the Holy Spirit, a symbol. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We are the son of truth. And oftentimes, when God says go, we say, no. We're not going to do it, just like Jonah did. And Jonah, God, it's just kind of a funny thing. It seems like Jonah says, God says, hey, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. And all the next, next scene, Jonah's paying a fare to go to Joppa. And then he's going to Tarshish. And he's out of here. He just exit stage right. He's gone. And I thought, you know, that's a lot like us. He's a son of truth. He is a son of truth. And yet he's running from God. And I think, you know, we all do that. We've all done that. We all do it from time to time. But God is always faithful to bring us back. In Philippians it says he's faithful to complete that which he finished. He started. He'll finish that which he started. And he does it. I've talked to you about kind of rubber band theology. He'll bring you back. It depends on how hard he brings you back. You see, we're, we all of a sudden decide we're going to rebel against God this week. Or we're going to rebel against God. And all of a sudden we're rebelling. And it's like a rubber band, right? And he has us. And all of a sudden, well, if we rebel, but we don't go that far and he brings us back, the slap's not very hard. But if we rebel and we rebel and we rebel, guess what? He's going to bring us back. It depends on how hard. And if we really rebel and we really rebel and we really rebel, he'll bring us back. And so Jonah... God says, I want you to go to Nineveh. It's interesting, Nineveh. It was an incredible city. They were warriors, they were very wealthy, and they were very, very wicked. You see, I was reading in uh, some commentary and some historical facts, Nineveh was a huge city. It had walls around it that were 100 feet high. And on the towers, every so often... The towers were 200 feet high. The wall was so thick that they raced chariots around the wall. It was huge. The city was 30, feet, 30 miles long and 15 miles wide. And there was a, a wall all the way around. It was impenetrable. When my mind's eye, have anybody seen Troy? You know, when the, the Greeks come in and they come up to Troy and they're on the, on the beach and you look at that city and it's walled, that's what I picture Nineveh like. They were warriors and mo they had a, about two to three hundred standing warriors that went out to conquer and do battle. So Nineveh was a city of warriors. They were very, very wealthy. They would go and take over a city. They would take the inhabitants, they would take their money, they would bring them back as slaves, they would put them to work, and as they worked they would collect taxes, and so they conquered everybody around them. So Nineveh was an incredible, powerful city. There were warriors, they were wealthy, but they also were very, very wicked. They would take their enemies, and they would take the leaders of their enemies, they would bring them into Nineveh, and some of the things that they did to them, they would cut out, cut off their eyelids and then make them stare at the sun until they become blind. They would fillet them alive. They would skin them and stretch the skin out so that they would use for their drums. They were really, really wicked. They would take a prisoner, cut his left arm off and his right leg off, and then send them on his way to die. They were vicious, and if that person survived, it was a horrible existence. And so, 
God says, Hey Jonah, I got an idea. I want you to go to Nineveh. And Jonah said, I ain't going. See you later. Bad. I'm gone. And a lot of people say, well, here's I wonder why Jonah didn't want to go. Number one, a lot of I was looking at a lot of theologians, a lot of uh, Bible scholars, and some would say, well, he didn't want to go because it was way too far from where he was at to where Nineveh was. It was about 500 miles. That's a long ways in a car, but on a donkey? My goodness. Let's say, let's say you, uh, you make 20 miles a day, 500 miles, 25 days just to get to Nineveh. That's not counting finding your food, finding a hotel, to take a shower, or whatever it is, 25 days. But see, I don't think that makes sense because it's 500 miles. God says go. He's a prophet of God. He's supposed to be obedient, but then he pays the fare to go to Joppa, to go to Tarshish, which is Spain, and he's on his way to Spain, which is 2,500 miles away. And he'd rather go to Spain than he would to Nineveh. Others said that he was kind of scared. Well, I can understand that. Because this is a wicked city, and here he comes with a message from a foreign god. And that message, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Now listen, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be restored, thus saith the Lord. There was no qualifier. He didn't say, if you don't repent, in 40 days you'll be destroyed. He said, thus saith the Lord. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Some people thought, well, that's kind of a bad message to bring to a king of a wicked, wicked city. And so he takes off. Some people say that he kind of despised the people. You see, Nineveh is in modern day Iraq. That's where Nineveh was. And I could understand that. Nin uh, uh, Jonah was a uh, son of Abraham. And he could have just said, you know what? I don't like those people. They're vicious people. They're animals. They kill themselves. They kill other people. They blow themselves up. They blow other people up. God wants me to go and share drinks to them. I'm out of here. And I can say, you know what? I understand that kind of feeling. Here's why. After 9-11, the sons of Nineveh attacked us. And there's something in our hearts as Americans, something in our spirits as patriots that says, I don't want to share nothing with those people. I don't have a calling to go to Iraq. I don't have a calling to go to Afghanistan. I don't have a calling to go anywhere there, Jordan, Libya, Syria, Iran, no way. They're sons of Nineveh and I ain't going. But God says, I want my people to go and share. So some people say it was too far. Some people say it was, he was afraid. Some people say he just was prejudiced and he didn't like the people. But I think the real reason, turn to chapter 4, verse 1. Here's the real reason. Look at what Jonah says to God. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Why? Because they repented. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know, listen, that you are a gracious God and a merciful God, slow to anger, and abundant and loving kindness, and one who relents from doing harm. That was the reason that Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Because God is gracious. Because God is merciful. Because God is kind. And he's patient. And God did, and Jonah didn't like those people. And God said, and Jonah knew that if they repented, God would forgive them. And he didn't want that to happen. And so he says, I'm out of time. And I think, wow. That's the condition 
of some in the church today. And it, I have to be honest with you. It was a little bit of the condition in my heart after 9-11. All I thought about is we should take as many bombers as possible, put some nukes in them, and just go to town and nuke that whole place, turn it into glass, we got rid of them, and we can move on. And God say, no, 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 I died for all those people. I love those people. You love those people? They hate you. They say they want to kill your people. Yeah, but I love them. They torture your people. Your people are in jail. Your people are tortured and killed and their kids are killed. You love them? Yeah, I love them. I want you to go tell them I love them very much. No! I'm not going. I am not going. That was Jonah's heart. It was the same situation. When Jonah says, God says, go. And Jonah says, no, I'm not going. So God says, but verse 4, but the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and every man cried out to his God. I underline that. And every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was on the ship into the sea to look, lighten the load. But Jonah had got down into the lower parts of the ship, and he lay down and fell asleep. So the captain came to him and said, Hey, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God, perhaps your God will consider us, so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. And so they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? And what is your country? And what kind of people are you? And so he said, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Did you catch that? I was reading that this morning. I thought, that's really interesting. Here's why. Jonah says, I'm a Hebrew. And listen to this. I fear the Lord. That word is worship. I, it's not fear. I got to do it. It's I worship the Lord who made the sea and dry land. And you get from the narrative as you read the record. And if you look at it from the Hebrew perspective, you get the the feeling, you get the, it implies that Jonah is a very, very, he has a relationship with God. He knows who God is. He's experienced God. He's not backslidden. He's not a, rebe he's not a uh, rebellion in the fact that that's how he lives his life. He even is so secure in his relationship with God that when the storm came, he just says, I know that my life is in God's hands. So he goes down and he falls asleep. He's, that's the implication. How can you fall asleep in a storm that's so bad that it's threatening to destroy the ship and tear it to pieces, but you get the feeling and it implies that Jonah knows his God so well that he just says, my life is in his hands. And he goes down and he falls asleep. So much so that the captain goes, well, what are you doing? You're sleeping? Why don't you get up and call on the name of your God? And here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking not every storm in our life is from Satan. Here's what I'm thinking. Carlos, Satan's really, really attacking. I, I, I have liver problems. Uh, I need a liver transplant. Oh, yeah, you do. That's all. We'll pray, but let me ask you a question. Do you drink? Yeah, I've been drinking for 30 years. <laughs> well, listen. Listen, that's not Satan. That's you. That storm came because of you. It's not Satan at all. It's you. Well, Carlos, 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 it's really Satan's attacking me, and I, I, I got fired from my job. You did? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you get there on time? Do you even get there early? No, sometimes I get there late. Oh, you get there late. 
Do you work really hard? Are you the best worker in your whole place? No. Last week, my boss caught me upstairs taking a nap. Well, listen, that storm isn't because of Satan. That storm is because of you. It's because of you. Carlos, my marriage is on the rocks. I understand. Well, let me ask you a few questions. Are you kind to one another? Do you listen to your spouse? Are you understanding to your spouse? Do you put your spouse before yourself? No, I'm the king of my house. Well, listen, <laughs> the storm is not because of Satan. He's not attacking. It's because of you. And a lot of the storms is because of us. And Jonah says, well, the storm is because of me. We're seeing a little bit. Yeah, not <coughs> every storm is from Satan. Some storms are from God. Some storms are from us, but some storms are like from God, like we see in this story. It's interesting. When we are in a place of rebellion, God often brings either a storm, He either brings a saint in our life, or He either brings a sinner. Yeah, oftentimes when we're rebelling, God uses storms, saints, or sinners. Yeah, a storm? Yeah, like He did with Jonah. He has a purpose, He has a plan, and He's going to accomplish that purpose even if he has to bring in a storm. I've experienced storms in my life that I brought on to myself and that God has brought to bring me to a place where I need to be. But often he brings saints into our path too when we're rebelling. You know, you're worked all day, you're hot and thirsty, and yeah, you're a Christian, but you know what really sounds good today? is a six-pack of Bud Light. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to drive past four or five liquor stores to the one on the other side of town, to the one that nobody knows me, and I'm going to get out of my car, I'm going to get my money, I'm going to buy some Bud Light, and nobody knows me, and you get to the freezer, you open the door, and you get the freezer, and somebody goes, Hey, didn't I see you at church? <laughs> this isn't for me, this is for my mom. <laughs> My mom, I don't know what's wrong with her, but I love her, and I want to do it, so but it's not for me. You know, oftentimes, the Lord brings in saints when we're in a state of rebellion. When there was blockbuster video, and you were like, all right, I'm going through the, the movies, and then you get into the... You know, and then all of a sudden those movies, you know, with the bad covers and you're sitting there looking and it's lady and then some guy goes, hey, Carlos, and you're like, oh, Lassie, I'm looking for Lassie, Lassie, yes, I don't know what that's doing there, but look at Lassie, and oftentimes when we're in a state of rebellion, God steps in. Yeah, oftentimes he brings in storms. Oftentimes he brings in saints, but oftentimes he brings in sinners. Just like this guy here. Jonah is sleeping, and the sinner, the pagan, the guy had to come in and say, Hey, sleeper! And what did he say? The same thing God said. Arise! Arise. A few years ago, I was in Irvine, California doing training. Remember, I went training uh, for when I got the job with Yellow Book. And uh, I, we were there two weeks, then we came home, they were there three weeks. And then they would pay for everything. They'd pay for the hotel, they would pay for the food. And then after the class, we'd go to swim or work out. Then we'd go to the restaurant, buy, get some food. And everybody would stay out because it was summertime out in the patio. And in the patio, there was a pool and there was a lake and it was really awesome and uh, the, the waitresses would come out and, and serve your food and we would just be eating there and I remember one night we had the whole group there and a, a couple of gals and a guy uh, came up and she started talking to one of the guys and found out she was a fortune teller, read your palms, uh, can read, tell stories and, I'm, and it's interesting and they're kind of joking with her 
Uh, um, she was an older gal, about 60 years old, older than me, about 60 years old, not old. <laughs> but she, I got a back pedal. But anyway, she was telling him, she, you know, and then all of a sudden, one of the guys says, out of this whole group, who's going to be the most successful at Yellow Road? And she looks, and she looks around at us, and she looks at me, she looks around, and she says, I'll tell you. But he, and she points at me, he says, he doesn't count. He's supposed to be doing something else. But he's running. And then he points to a young man, he says, you're going to be the most successful. And then she turns around to me and says, forget about your past, move towards the future. A wicked sinner. And that cut me to the very core. It cut me to the very floor. Yeah. Oftentimes, when we're in a state of rebellion, God uses storms, and God uses saints, and God uses sinners, and God used all three on Jonah. Look at verse 10. Then the men, after he said, I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord who made heaven and the sea. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, why have you done this? What a rebuke from a pagan. Why are you doing this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they couldn't, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, <coughs> and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done it as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, and they threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and they took vows. Wow! What's an amazing thing. Jonah is a man of God. He has a relationship with God, but he's in rebelling against God right now. And God uses a storm, and God uses a sinner. And says, how can you do this to your God? What are you doing? Remember when Abraham was going into Egypt? And Sarah was old, but she was supposed to be apparently very beautiful. And he was so afraid that the Pharaoh would kill him to take Sarah to be in his uh, harem, that he said, hey, listen. Let's say that you're my sister and not my wife. That way they won't kill me and you'll be okay. What? So they did that. They said, she's my sister. Took him into his harem. Took, you know, and she was getting all bathed. They put makeup on her, put wigs on her. She was doing all these things. But meanwhile, Abraham's outside the palace door going, hey, look what they gave me. They gave me all these sheep and camel. Look at, I'm getting rich. And Sarah's going, help. And he's going, and that night the king had a dream. And God said, you touch that woman, you're dead meat. And that king woke up in, this, in the next morning and said, what are you doing, Abraham? How can you do this to your God? You would have destroyed all of us and yourself. A rebuke from a pagan God, a pagan king, to a godly man. He was called the friend of God. A rebuke. And that's what's happening with Jonah right now. A pagan man says, how can you do that to your God? And he says, you know what? I'm going to fess up. I'm going to own up. This storm, this tempest, is because of me. It's because of me. That's when the Lord goes to work. And here's the amazing thing about the Lord. Here's the amazing thing. 
took me really off guard this week. Jonah's running. Jonah's in rebellion. Remember I said, <clears throat> underline that, that they prayed all of them to the <coughs> one God? And now at the end, when we just finished, what are they doing? They're praying to God. They're praising God. They sacrificed to the Lord. And they made vows to the Lord. What did they do? They got rid of their gods. And now the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is their God. And God says, ah, my I've accomplished my purpose. What's that? <laughs> Listen, the, Jonah's in rebellion. He's running away from God. He's in a storm. These pagan men. And God says, I love those pagan men. And he uses a rebellious child to accomplish his will. And even in Jonah's rebellion, people are getting saved. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing that God did that. And now these pagan fishermen serve and sacrifice to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the one that led them to the Lord, they pick up and throw them in the water <laughs> into the storm. I think about Joseph when Judah and his brothers say, we're going to sell him. We're going to sell him to this caravan. He's going to Egypt. He's going to be a slave. He's going to be thrown in prison. And God says, do it. It's my plan. And Joseph goes, no! Do it. It's my plan. No! And God uses their character, their bent, to accomplish their will. And all of a sudden, you know the story. Because Judah and Joseph's brothers all sold him into slave, they saved the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel is saved because of it. Because God will accomplish His purpose. People say, when you, if the only way the Lord can use you is you got to do this and you've got to be right, you can't make mistakes, you can never do that. Listen. God loves us. God loves us. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's kind, he's patient, and even in your rebellion right now, you can say, the storm is because of me. And he'll use you. You might get a little wet, but he'll use you. He'll use you. And look at verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and for three nights. How can a fish swallow a man and the man survive for three days and three nights? And I heard a professor say, that's fairy tale with the gastric acids, no oxygen. It's absolutely impossible for a man to live in a whale for three days. I was doing some research, going through all... Uh, the things that I go through to research these things. And these are the things I came up with. Listen to this. They caught a white shark with a 500-pound sea elephant in a hole in its belly. Mm -hmm. They found another white shark. They cut it open and had a complete suit of armor. This was in the early, uh, late 1800s. A complete suit of armor. Not even It was inside the belly. Can you imagine that guy falling off the ship or something? <laughs> he falling off the ship in his suit of armor or somebody threw him in and the shark swallowed him whole. In 1930, they, off the coast of New England, listen to this, a sulfur bottom well over a hundred feet long, they caught. There's a, I was reading a story, this Dr. Ransom Harvey, he was taking an Atlantic in the 1800s, a trip from New York to uh, England, and he said that they, their ship was going, and then on the other, about maybe a mile out this way, there was a whaling ship that was kind of mirroring them, coming across, and he said one night the storm was getting really bad, and all of a sudden the wave came in and it swept this little dog over the, over the, the, the side, and that dog was lost. He said six days later, that whaling ship caught a whale, 
they were dressing it out. When they got to the stomach, they were getting into the top part here, and it says they could hear barking, and that little dog was in the nasal cavity of the whale for six days. It's amazing. And then I was reading, they said that uh, in, a, in, a, in a sperm whale, the nasal cavity is six feet high and about ten feet wide in the nasal cavity. Interesting. Dr. Rimmer interviewed a man that was swallowed by a whale shark and he was in there for two days. He um, interviewed him two years later and he was still bleached white and bald. They said he looked, he, he fell in and got swallowed looking like Fabio and he got out looking like me. That's what it looked like. And so, so yeah, it's possible. Two years later. And so Jonah now is running from God. He's in the belly of the whale or in the nasal cavity. I'm sure it wasn't a good experience. Look at what he says in chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly and said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me, Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The water surrounded me even to my soul, the deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. And when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving, I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is the Lord's. And then the Lord spoke to the whale and he threw Jonah up on the land. That's it? <laughs> That's all you have to do? And he threw him up on dry land. Can you imagine all those people there that were fishing, that were bathing that were there because let me tell you God doesn't do it his character this whale comes out of the water and God doesn't do anything in a corner he doesn't do anything in secret when Jonah got barfed in the, on that beach guess what there was a crowd and they were looking and they were watching and it makes perfect sense because their God was Dagon, a fish God. He had the head and the arms of a fish and a body of a man. That was their God. And when that fish came out of the water and spit this man up, and he came out bleached and white and no hair, and says, yet 40 days, and Nineveh will be destroyed. Guess what? Everybody listen. They took him right to the king. And we're going to see next week what happens. But God is smart. He knows what he's doing. Here's what I'm thinking as we're bringing this to a close. I've heard over the years, as I see myself and others, that have went astray. The Lord loves you. And how the church says, we'll take you back if you follow these 12 steps, you do these things. Certainly there has to be repentance. Repentance means in the Greek metanoia. Meta to change, where we get a word metamorphosis or metaphysics. Noia means mind. Certainly, when we're in a state of rebellion, we have to change our mind. And sometimes 
It takes a storm or a saint or a sinner to change our minds. And it, for Jonah, it took being in the belly of a fish where he said, Then I looked up to the Lord and cried out to the Lord and said, Have mercy on me, O God. But listen, that was it. And all of a sudden when God heard that, there goes Jonah right on the beach. And God says, Okay, go now. Do what I told you to do. That was it. That was all. That's God's heart. That's God's character. That's God's way. He knows that we are flesh and we're dust. But when we come back to the Lord, it's not 12 steps. It's not jump through these hoops. It's have mercy on me. This storm is because of me. Have mercy on me. Forgive me. Whatever. I repent. And God says, all right. That's what I've been waiting for. Come here. Give me a hug. That's God. That's what he does. And so whether it's us or somebody you're talking to, God loves them. God doesn't, isn't disappointed in them. God isn't mad and angry at them. God just wants them to experience who He is, how gracious He is, how merciful He is, and how kind He is. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Amen?